Meg Hunter Kilmer is an itinerant missionary. She's a storyteller. She travels the world telling people about the fierce and tender love of God, and we're thrilled to have her with us today. So, Meg, you used to travel in your car, as I recall. Uh, you referred to yourself as a hobo for Christ. Mm -hmm. But what made you leave that and buy a house? Oh, God's mercy. I tell you what, I had been living out of my car for 12 years, and I had been ready to move on for a real long time, and yeah, I just hadn't felt, oh yeah, for <laughs> like 10 years maybe. Um, and I just hadn't felt released by the Lord. I, w I didn't feel pulled in any particular direction. And then campus ministry at the University of Notre Dame reached out and asked if I was interested in working there. And I'm a double domer, so I was interested. Um, and everything, there was just peace. There was just peace in taking the job. There was peace in purchasing a house out of nowhere. And in my experience, when there is a big decision and there's just peace, you got to listen to that. And mm -hmm. I just didn't feel like the Holy Spirit was holding me back at all. And this was a huge shift after 10 years out of a car. So I was like, all right, Lord, well, I'm going a, I'm to a buy this house real quick before you change your mind. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see this is where you want me. And so far, it's just been incredible yeah. to live in a house, to sleep in a bed. God is so good to me. It's going to be a bit of a shift, I think, uh, going back to regular life after being at this gathering of more than 50,000 people in Indianapolis, all Catholic, all smiling, all happy to be here and happy to be with Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. Uh, but, you know, when you, you do go home, um, how, how do you think this is going to affect your, your life, your ministry, uh, your relationship with the Lord? You know, I think for me, a lot of what the Lord has been doing this weekend is just showing me his faithfulness. I just keep seeing one person after another after another who I've loved at different stages of my life. And it feels like heaven, right? It feels like we've entered into the beatific vision and it's just, oh my gosh, my second grade teacher. Like, oh my gosh, the person that I went to middle school with, right? Like to see how God has been working and for him to draw all the threads together and that joy. So I think that I think what the Lord is really working on in me is just to, to trust him when the prayers aren't answered, that he is answering prayers, just not on the timing that I would necessarily have hoped for. It is kind of amazing when you go to an event like this where it's all Catholics, you bump into people who you met somewhere along the line or you worked with or you knew in some way or they knew you. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a sense of unity, of oneness to the Catholic community uh, beyond our parishes and dioceses. So it's pretty amazing to experience that. Now, during the Eucharistic Congress, did you not give one of the impact session? What is an impact session anyway? I, I don't think people realize. So we've got, I think, five tracks in the morning. So in the evening, the thing people have been watching, uh, live streaming with Father yeah. Mike Schmitz and Father Josh Johnson and Sister Miriam, uh, that's everybody all together in Lucas Oils. So that's 50,000 people. In the mornings, there's a track for missionaries, a track for church workers, a track for priests, a Spanish track, family track, and then I think everybody all together. So I was speaking to missionaries on healing and the Eucharist and accompanying people who are seeking healing, but I felt like the Holy Spirit just wanted to, to speak a word of conviction. Um, and so I came in and talked about how self-congratulatory we can become when we consider ourselves missionaries, how we, we look at Jesus on the cross and we say, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've been there, Bishop, but I have certainly been there. And so we looked at the story of Matthew's call, which Matthew tells in the middle of 10 miracles. And it's so clear that Matthew's like, y'all, the miracle was that he wanted me. The miracle was that he chose me, and the miracle was that I responded. And so looking at our lives and being astonished again at what God has done, and then speaking the name of Jesus from that gratitude. Okay. Um, so it was, it was intense. It was 20 minutes, which I don't do anything in 20 minutes, right? Give me an hour, give me nothing. But I managed it. Um, well, you like a longer period. I, oh, yeah. I prefer. Well, you're used to the homilies, yeah, right? And I'm, I was and a teacher. And a TV homily is even shorter. Exactly. I was a teacher for five years. So I was like, if we're not doing 45 minutes, I might as well not even stand up. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. But I managed it 20 minutes and two seconds. So. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh... I, I heard that you have a pilgrimage to South Korea. So Do you want to come? I, I haven't thought about you it. You should come. 
Vietnam. Why, why? I've never heard of anyone going on a pilgrimage to South Korea, but there must be a reason. South Korea is the coolest Catholic country. So every other country in the history of the world was evangelized by missionaries. South Korea evangelized itself. Some teenage boys found a book by Father Matteo Ricci about Jesus, read it, were like, yep. This works. Smuggled one of their buddies out of the country to get baptized. He got smuggled back in. They spread out a map, went out baptizing. Six months, they baptized a thousand people. In the first 50 years, there were Catholics in Korea. There was one priest for six years total. And he was an undocumented immigrant from China. Everything else was grassroots, lay led. There's no colonialism that's involved. There's no imperialism that's involved. This is just people hungry for Jesus who embraced him. And South Korea, there's all kinds of persecutions. They've got 103 saints, 124 blesseds, one venerable, and 252 servants of God. So it's like per square mile, it's on par with I'll Italy. Say, are yeah. any of those blesseds or saints? Uh, particularly, uh, you're particularly fond of? Saint Agatha Kim Agi is one of, my, one of my favorite stories to tell. She was intellectually disabled. And when she went and asked to be baptized, they asked her to recite the creed and she couldn't. She said, I only know Jesus and Mary. And they said, okay, well, how about the Our Father? And she said, I only know Jesus and Mary. And they tried to teach her the Hail Mary. She couldn't do it. So they sent her away without baptism. Now, in fairness, they were doing a great job at building their own church without benefit of clergy, right? They, they were doing they great, were. They get some were. things a little bit wrong. But the government didn't care that she wasn't baptized. They weren't checking baptismal certificates, right? They arrested her for being Christian. And they demanded that she deny Jesus. And she said, I only know Jesus and Mary. Wow, what a great story. Right. Well, you know, the goal for all of us is to become saints, obscure or not. <laughs> so I hope you do, and I hope I do. Amen. And I hope we meet someday in heaven, yes. but maybe even before that. It would be lovely. Thank you so much for your inspiring words to more than 50,000 people here, to us in this interview. And uh, we hope to have a chance to talk to you again down the road. Wonderful. 